the Tallahassee City Commission, well, well actually, the All-America City of Tallahassee for our uh, yeah. budget hearing. Um, I also want to, before we get started with uh, today's session, want to um, uh, acknowledge uh, specifically for the treasurer, treasurer clerk uh, staff uh, and for the entire city of Tallahassee family. Uh, we did uh, learn um, of the overnight passing of uh, Miss Helen Jackson, who was a staffer and the treasurer clerk's uh, office. And so we send our um, deepest condolences uh, to her family. Uh, to the staff of the Treasurer Clerk's Office and the entire city of Tallahassee family uh, during, this, um, during this difficult time. Um, the Treasurer Clerk uh, is also away at a conference, uh, and so Matt, I understand you'll be uh, subbing in. He did make the request that for any questions uh, specific to the Treasurer Clerk's Office budget that we uh, um, try to reserve those for when he is back in because we have frankly, a long enough leg before now and the point at which this budget gets adopted, we'll have the opportunity to, to, do, to do just that. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I believe today is the first day of all of our summer youth fellows starting here in City Hall and throughout the government. Um, there'll be an announcement uh, about that later, but um, if you see a lot of young faces moving around this building, it's because we've got about 100 of them uh, between the POPs program and our Summer Youth Leadership Academy. Uh, who are working within this government. And I just wanted to acknowledge real quickly three who are working in the Mayor and City Commission office and are available to assist uh, uh, each of you. Ms. Amani Sapp, uh, Ms. Desiree Knight, and Ms. Um, Maisha uh, Easter. Is that right? All three of them are in the back and they'll be assisting in the Mayor and City Commission office and are extremely happy to do so. So we want to welcome you all along with the other fellows. Um, with that, you'll notice uh, the manager is sitting out there. Uh, in the ACM, um, Mr. Fernandez is here. Uh, today's uh, introductory comments about the budget. Uh, the budget will be introduced by our um, assistant city, uh, city manager, uh, Mr. Rick Fernandez. And I think with that, we'll go ahead and begin today's proceedings. Um, we will actually reserve the introduction of the budget. Uh, you may want to make some opening comments, and then we'll open up for 30 minutes of public comment. Um, each speaker will be given three minutes, three minutes, and we'll have the timer. We'll ask that you come to the podium there um, as this session is being uh, is being televised. So, uh, Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I think I will withhold my comments until uh, after the speakers. OK, sounds good. So we'll begin with the first uh, speaker. And Mr. Mayor, we have slightly over a half a dozen speakers. Uh, the first speaker will be Ellen Pekalkovich. Uh, if you can, please come up to the microphone to the audience's left, and if you would, state your name and address for the record. Uh, good morning. Name is Ellen Pjeklalkevich. I'm Executive Director of United Partners for Human Services, and my address is 8327 Inverness Drive. And I, first of all, just want to thank uh, City Manager Thompson for her budget recommendations and including the CHSP increase, uh, requested increase, and thank all of you for your continued support of that program. Uh, we wanted to reiterate the importance of CHSP um, on the city of Tallahassee and Leon County. Our report that we released in March uh, showed that uh, the impact can be measured in five different areas, outside revenue, cost savings to society, learning and earning, multiplying impact, and strengthening the community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. The next speaker will be Jackie Malone, to be followed by Pam Wilson. And again, if you would, state your name and address for the record. Hey, good morning. I'm Jackie Malone, 6010 Rich Farm Road, and I'm the Executive Director of Breon Family Services. Thank you so much for your continued support year after year of CHSP. We ask that you support the increased funding as recommended. Um, the Leon uh, County and Tallahassee area faces significant challenges regarding how to support, sustain, and enhance the delivery of vital community support services. As you know, community needs are overwhelming the current social service delivery systems. CHSP funds are critical 
to our ability to serve this community. As an example, Freon Family Services utilizes CHSP funds each year to leverage outside funding. Each CHSP dollar leverages an additional $3 for Breon. Similar, similarly, other agencies have such a return on investment. So an additional $450,000 as proposed of CHSP from the city could leverage an additional $1.35 million of outside funding. So this uh, could be very helpful in us enhancing and increasing the service possibility in our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is David Jones to be followed by Lori Gussick. Skip Pam Wilson. I'm, a okay. <laughs> I'm Pam Wilson. My address is 8530 Charrington Forest Boulevard. I'm the executive director of Capital Medical Society Foundation and uh, we have the We Care Network. I too wanted to just reiterate my gratitude for you all to continue to move forward with uh, CHSP increased funding. We Care Network provides, uh, leverages about $3 million worth of donated specialty medical care for Leon County residents. We do that with a staff of three case managers and our in program coordinator. Basically, for every dollar of the $32,500 that we request in CHSP funding, we leverage $92 in donated care. So that is a good return on your investment for the health care of this community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Lori Gussack, 6160 Jason Trail. I'm the Executive Director for Florida Disabled Outdoors Association, and I just want to thank you for your support for people of all abilities. Florida Disabled Outdoors Association, um, it affects all aspects of life, not only recreation. It helps people with uh, vocational skills and also is one of the crime preventative programs that we have. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Kevin Priest, followed by Gail Workman. <clears throat> Good morning, I'm Kevin Priest of 1920 East Indian Head Drive, and I'm the Executive Director of Capital City Youth Services. And I'm here along with my colleagues to basically uh, support the city manager and her uh, ask for additional funding to the CHSP process. We received CHSP money for uh, Capital City Youth Services, and that is much of a, a great need to us because of what we're able to do in matching that with federal and state dollars. Uh, so much like my colleagues already mentioned, uh, able to leverage that money, we're getting the best bang for our buck. So I wanted to thank you again, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Gail Workman, 2520 Stonehouse Court. I'm here this morning representing the Literacy Volunteers of Leon County. I'm a new board member. And I just wanted to thank you for CH CHHP funding because this year was the first year that I sat on Team 5, the review team. And after two days of listening to organizations and learning about organizations and what these organizations do in our community, I was so proud to be a member of this community and a community that supports its citizens in this way. So I would encourage you to consider increasing support, continuing to support. It is a wonderful, wonderful thing that this community, part of why I'm sure we're an all-American city, um, because we have this kind of support of our nonprofit agencies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker would be David Jones. I'll wait my time. Lord, Thank you. Thank you. And followed by Mary Deckel. And I believe she will be our final speaker unless there are any additional. Good morning. I'm Mary Deekle from Legal Services of North Florida. I bring you greetings from not only our clients, but our executive director, Chris Nabb, who is across the street 
uh, asking for funding for legal services and will be here a little bit later in case you need to speak with her. Um, I have packets for everybody. I know we've visited with some of you folks, but uh, to, to ask about funding for legal services in North Florida, and this is our kind of official request for that, um, I did not see it in the budget. Uh, it may be there somewhere else, but I just didn't, uh, wasn't able to find it. We want to talk to you a little bit about our work in preventing crime in the community. Uh, we've given you some information, some studies from New York City, New York State, excuse me, and also in our own community that talks about how when there is civil legal representation of domestic violence victims, of children, of people who are escaping homelessness, we reduce crime. Uh, the studies also show that for every dollar we spend, $4.97 is returned to our community and reduced expenses on law enforcement and the, also the resulting crime on property and people and incarceration. Uh, we had a, a, a wonderful program with children where we took kids who were running afoul of the law and we're able to step in and look at the civil legal uh, ramification studies of what was happening in their lives. And that had to do with homelessness, domestic violence, with sexual assault, and with educational access. And when we're able to step in and keep a child in school, then they're not on the streets and they're not in crime. If we're keeping a child in their home and their family together, they're not skipping around from school to school. They're not having to stay up till 4 o'clock in the morning because of disruptions in the home. And they are doing better in school and they're staying in school and they're not on the streets. When we can do those things, it helps to partner with all the other activities we're doing in our community to try to reduce crime. Uh, you've seen from the information that our funding has been reduced greatly. Uh, we've had to reduce our staff. Uh, we would like to ask for this $50,000 so that we can maintain staff to provide services. Um, I know I don't have much time, and I'll be glad to answer any other questions you might have. Great. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. And that is our final speaker. That final speaker you said? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Um, Ms. Fernandez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, staff, visitors. Uh, today we're conducting our first budget workshop on the proposed operating and capital budget for the fiscal year 2016 for this All America City of Tallahassee. The proposed budget presented for City Commission consideration is balanced and totals $704 million. This is an increase of 1% over the last fiscal year. The capital budget for next year totals $144 million. And for the next five years, the capital plan, you will only approve in the next year, but the capital plan presented to you for the five years is $754 million. I'm confident that the proposed budget addresses city commission priorities as outlined to us during your retreat, the budget updates, and other city commission meetings. As the commission is aware, we started this year's budget process with a shortfall that was primarily caused by the use of one-time revenues to balance the current year. Over the last few years, this has been an appropriate strategy to utilize during the economic downturn as we maintain service levels for the community. However, as we have mentioned to the commission before, this is not an effective long-term strategy for balancing the budget in light of the critical needs of the community. This all America city prides itself on its ability to provide the highest quality services to our citizens, whether it is through the nation's number one public utility or our outstanding parks and recreation department. We strive to make every interaction with our customers the best experience possible. As we experienced in Denver this past weekend, we're a model organization and one that stands out for its creativity in finding solutions to community problems. It's professionalism in ensuring that we efficiently and effectively manage the resources we receive from our citizens and its passion for serving the citizens of this community. There comes a point, however, due to growing demand and lack of available resources when services struggle to meet our community's high standards. We're at a critical point in this community and our continued success will depend on how we address some of our challenges 
including providing additional resources for our public safety, providing needed funds to proactively maintain and refurbish our aging facilities and infrastructure, and continue to address social service needs of our residents. To this end, the proposed budget presented for your consideration includes an increase in the millage rate of one mil. We have started to address some of these challenges and in response to the recent surge in crime, Operation Safe Neighborhoods was launched earlier this month in partnership with local leaders, law enforcement, and the faith-based community. A key component of this initiative is providing additional resources to law enforcement so they can not only work to reduce violent crimes, but also engage the citizens they serve in a meaningful way. In support of this, the proposed budget includes 18 new police positions, 16 officers and two investigators. These positions are in addition to the six officers in the current fiscal year paid for with one-time revenue. Moving beyond public safety, the proposed budget contains additional staffing, which we will go over in more detail during this morning's workshop. Throughout the administrative budget process, we considered the priorities and needs of the city's departments and weighed those against the resources available to us. As a result, the proposed budget recommends adding a total of 41 positions, 34 of which are for police and fire, with 19 being in the general fund. Staff will provide additional detail on all those positions. As in the past few years, capital needs exceed available resources and funding. For, most of our, for, mo for several projects, were deferred to a future year, reduced or eliminated to balance the capital budget in 16. We have been able to identify $3.4 million in funding to continue doing maintenance projects within departments, as well as address some public safety needs, including the purchase of body-worn cameras and supporting equipment for TPD. Staff will also be discussing what projects are being recommended. The proposed budget also seeks to address the priorities identified by the City Commission during the beginning stages of the budget process. For example, the proposed budget includes an increase to the City's CHSP contribution by nearly $450,000 and funding for the Honor Flight Program and the Florida Veterans Foundation Stand Down event for $10,000 each. Finally, as mentioned previously, the proposed budget seeks to address the ongoing public safety needs identified by the City Commission. There is a limit to what can be achieved without the addition of new revenue to support all those priorities. Furthermore, there are a number of external issues that remain to be resolved that could impact the fiscal 2016 budget, 2016 budget, primarily those related to state revenue sharing. It is anticipated that the new revenue sharing estimates will be released in late July, one month after the legislative uh, special session. As we have done in the past, we would like to follow the flagging process for budget issues whereby two commissioners would flag any items for additional information or action. Departmental staff is also here to respond to any questions that you may have on specific budgets. Now I'd like to turn it over to Raul Lavin to go into the details of the proposed budget. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez, Mayor and City Commissioners. Uh, as a, uh, Assistant City Manager indicated, uh, we are presenting a balanced budget uh, for FY16. Um, for your consideration today and for uh, comments and, and uh, input on the recommendations contained in the budget. Uh, the budget actually provides a long-term strategy uh, for balanced budgets over the next four years. Uh, as you know, uh, over the past few years, we've used a lot of one-time revenues to balance budgets. Uh, the proposed budget in front of you does not do that. Um, we get away from that as a result of the additional revenue sources, uh, revenues generated from the property tax recommendation. I think uh, over the last um, eight years, our story has been pretty impressive, and I think it's something that we need to tout because uh, we have really uh, held the belt, uh, controlled expenses uh, as a chart. Uh, that's displayed on the screen shows. And I think this is a great testament to the financial stewardship of the City Commission uh, over the last eight years. 
the general fund budget, which is the budget that supports uh, most general government operations, where our, which our citizens think are essential services, police, public works, parks and recreation, has really not grown that much over the last eight years. You have a, probably a six-tenth of a percent increase on average over the last eight years. Uh, in comparison, uh, the consumer price index and the inflationary factor has been a little over 2%. So we haven't really even kept up with inflationary pressures over the last eight years. This in light of some significant increases to the budget uh, in health care, pension requirements, fuel requirements, uh, the impact of collective bargaining agreements. We've been able to absorb a lot of that by taking a lot of actions uh, over the last few years, including elimination of staffing positions. We've probably reduced about 150 positions over that time period, which equates to about 6% of the total workforce. Uh, we've asked our employees to pick up additional costs as it relates to health care and pension. Uh, we've done employee furloughs. We've uh, downgraded department director positions. We've eliminated some departments. Uh, we've streamlined operations. So we've done a lot of things to be able to control the growth patterns over the last eight years uh, in the general fund. And as the chart indicates, uh, the growth has been pretty much flat over the last eight years. Uh, one of the most impressive things is that even during these challenging times with limited resources, declining revenues, uh, increases in costs, We've been able to provide balanced budgets, but also, as you know, restore the deficiencies fund, which uh, eight years ago was almost at $4 million, with a policy level at that time being about $22 million. Uh, as you'll recall, because of that, uh, we got placed on a negative credit watch uh, by the credit rating agencies. Uh, we brought a plan to the city commission during these tough times, uh, and we held to that to uh, restore that uh, deficiencies fund within a seven-year period. And we're probably at about 85%, which I think is a great uh, action on behalf of the commission and great uh, financial stewardship of our finances. So uh, where do we go from here? There are not many options left on the table uh, to balance the budget and to address the critical resources that this community needs. As you all know, there's a lot of uh, resource needs in the public safety arena. There's a lot of resource needs to maintain our aging infrastructure, uh, our facilities, uh, and there are no real big options left on the table to generate the resources necessary to address all those needs uh, other than significant um, budget cutbacks and program cutbacks. And as you all know, our community has indicated that they do not want to see that. Uh, they are happy with the services we provide and given the choice of maintaining or cutting, they want us to maintain services. So just want to lay that out as a foundation for what our budget uh, is for 2016 and our recommendations. And I'm gonna have Heath go over the numbers briefly and some of the highlights, and we'll be happy to entertain questions uh, throughout uh, our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, today we're going to be discussing the operating budget for FY16. Uh, then we'll talk about we do have a handful of unresolved issues that we want to bring to your attention, and then we'll, we'll follow up with capital. Uh, as was stated earlier, what we'd like to do is uh, have the commissioners flag items that they would like for discussion. Obviously, we'll try to answer as many questions today as we can. But if there are items that require some more information, we will go back, uh, work with the appropriate departments to collect that, and bring that back to you at the next workshop, which is scheduled for July 7th. <clears throat> uh, the budget process for FY16 is, is pretty much the same as it has been for the last budget cycles. Uh, what we've done is we've, we've listened to the community. We've taken city commission input from both the retreat uh, at the March uh, budget update, we were provided with a lot of priorities from the City Commission, which we have uh, included as, as many as we could with the resources at hand into the FY16 budget. Uh, also, we asked departments to, when applicable, maintain current service level from FY15, but obviously start identifying important needs that need to be addressed for the future. 
Uh, we've talked about the total operating budget uh, going up by a, a net of 1% to $704 million, with the capital budget being about $143 million, which is a 4.6% increase over last year. Uh, the first that we want to go into is talking about the assumptions uh, for balancing the FY16 budget. Uh, obviously, the, the key component here has been the increase of the millage rate by one mil. Uh, we only have preliminary estimates from the property appraisers. We get the final estimates July 1st, which we will come back and, and uh, obviously ask the City Commission to adopt a tentative millage rate on July 8th. Uh, some of the supporting strategies for why we did this, uh, we talked about it earlier, the use of one-time revenue. We, during our May update, we, we talked about a policy that we wanted to limit the use of one-time revenue. We wanted to eliminate it completely, but we definitely want to limit the use of it when, when applicable. We heard you at the last update where you said you did not want us to use capital funding. We had identified 750000 from capital funding. We have left that and actually programmed that for capital projects. Uh, we do have one-time revenue this year of sixteen of 650000 from the Special Insurance Risk Reserve, but that's only for FY16. The budget proposed to you has this balancing without one-time revenues for the years to come. So this would be the last year, and this keeps us at about half a percent, uh, which is well under the, the target policy that we sort of set last year, which was to limit it to 1 percent or less of the operating budget for FY16. Uh, another impact since we last talked, uh, the transfers from uh, electric and gas are based off of a CPI number, and that CPI number is actually from September to August. We're sort of in the middle of that. Currently, that time frame is running negative. What we have done is we've projected it to be flat, keeping the transfers the same from FY15 to FY16 for electric and gas. That, let me go back real quick, that impact is about a, a negative $1 million on, on the general fund. This chart and presentation shows uh, what the transfers will be from each. Now, we're basically using the policies this year. Last year we asked for modifications. This year we're holding to the policies. Uh, we see a, a slight decline in water uh, with just a slight uptick in the others. We've also provided the percentage of each of those transfers into the general fund. Uh, we talked about personnel for the total operating budget. There is a, a request for 41 additional positions, but as was stated earlier, 34 of those positions are for police and fire. Uh, the fire services fee will be, will be uh, providing the revenue for the 16 new firefighters for Station 16. Uh, in the general fund, in this next presentation, you can see that we've, uh, uh, the impact is really the police officers. We've added one horticulturalist technician position specifically for Cascades Park. This is so they can go in and they can maintain uh, the, the greenery and the flowers and make that, uh, that really jewel of an amenity that we have to keep it up to our standards. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get to the other items. We wanted to provide the staffing chart. Uh, as you can see, there is an uptick from the prior years, but we're still well below what we've done in, uh, uh, since 2007. <coughs> Uh, in the budget book, we list all of the increases, both those that are proposed and those that weren't proposed, and they're in Section D, beginning on page 14. These are the major changes. Obviously, it's, it's adding 18 positions uh, in the police department, 16 police officers, and two investigators. Um, the second big impact is for Cascades Park. It's for the one position and obviously the flowers and, and the other shrubbery that need to go with it. Also, that will include some holiday decorations so they can light the park uh, during Christmas and other holiday events. Uh, we've already talked about this as well. Uh, part of this uh, and priorities that we heard from the City Commission, we have proposed uh, increasing the CHSP by $442,000. Also, we are providing funding for the honor flight and for the veteran stand-down event. Later on, towards the end of the presentation, I'll get into some of the unresolved items where, where we're still, uh, we were unable to find funding for them in FY16, but we'll, uh, uh, we'll talk more about that. The 
This is a chart that shows how the general fund will go up in FY16. It's a 5% increase over FY15. Again, the majority of that is public safety driven. Based off of the police officers with their equipment, the vehicles, and capital items. To do this, we, we are proposing raising the millage again from 3.7 to 4.7. I know I ran through that quickly for the general fund. Uh, at this time, I'll just take a minute to see if there's any questions on the general fund before I go into the other funds or I can continue and we can have questions at the end. But I still have the remaining capital to go through. Yes, Commissioner. Um, I have a question. Are we going to talk about the body cameras a little bit later? Yes, it'll be in the... Okay. And also Commissioner, I have a... can you use your uh, microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. But no worries. I'm still... Denver time. Um, I have a question about the public works person, mainly because of the statement that was made in the uh, in the document about their being able to keep their people busy. So, can we talk about that later, mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor? What are the uh, pension changes for police? Uh, the pension changes uh, it went from about twenty three percent to twenty five percent. So what's the fiscal impact of? Uh, at the same time, uh, I, we'll get those exact numbers for you, but at the same time, the general employee pension dropped and the net impact uh, between the, the drop in general employees and the increase was about $200,000, but I'll get those, those actual numbers for you. Okay, thank you. Mayor. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I am uh, curious as to, I, I know the chief has requested 41 positions over the next three fiscal years. Could we have some discussion uh, in the out years beyond fiscal 16, how we would support that uh, if that were the direction that the commission chose to go in? Uh, yes, we can definitely have that discussion. I, I would say we can have a preliminary discussion today and based off a of direction, we could bring back a, a, a complete discussion uh, July 7th. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, going into the other funds, uh, all the other funds are, are balanced for obviously for FY16. Uh, there's really no major changes. Uh, uh, all the departments did an excellent job of really maintaining the current service level. <coughs> the uh, building inspection fund uh, again is balanced. They still have an outstanding loan to the deficiency fund. They owe a total of 628000 There is a scheduled payment at the end of this year, and there's two more payments expected in FY16 and FY17. Uh, fire, obviously, uh, we have a new fire services fee that we uh, have approved and implemented. Uh, this will pay for some, it'll be in effect for the next five years. It'll pay for needed capital items as well as the 16 new positions. The cemetery fund is balanced. It did require a, a slight transfer from the perpetual trust fund. And they're also in the process of expanding to the cemeteries. Stormwater, we have it balanced in all five years. Uh, they are they are still waiting for some information from the federal government on some standards that they have to implement. So we have a reserve policy that would, would have their capital reserves at a much lower level than what it currently stands, and we're just asking for a waiver from that policy so that we're not in violation of it. Uh, Star Metro, uh, we see a slight uptick in FY16. We uh, are providing a transfer from the general fund to, to help support operations. I know that we're working with them to, to cons constantly uh, look for efficiencies and ways to reduce their overall expenditures. And I'm sure there'll be some more items coming back to you in the near future on, on how we plan to continue to, uh, to do that. The gas is balanced. Um, Again, that was one that I mentioned earlier that based off of the CPI that the transfer is going to be flat. We actually see a decrease in their operation expenses for FY16. Water also has a different uh, transfer formula, uh, but we see it going down, the transfer to the general fund going down by a little over 300000 for FY16.
sewer is balanced in um, all five years, uh, we see a, a slight uptick in their operating expenditures. Electric had, uh, we saw some more fuel savings, so their, their operation, operating budget is going down. Uh, and again, based off the CPI, uh, their transfer will remain flat for FY16. Airport is balanced. Uh, they're looking at some other revenue options. Uh, I know that some of those ideas will be coming back to the commission. Uh, we just see a, a very, very slight uptick from their FY15 budget. <coughs> Solid waste, uh, again, they're balanced. We, uh, we expect uh, the transfer of the general fund at 1.8 million for FY16. And the golf course is balanced as well. We see a, a, just a, a minor downturn, downtick in their operation expenses for FY16. Uh, that'll take into the, to the capital discussion. If there's any questions about any of the funds that we can answer now or any information you would like for us to bring back before I jump into capital. Any questions on the funds? I think we're good. Okay. Uh, the first Sorry slide. I ask my personnel question? This is, uh, you know, the, is it related to public one works? of the funds? Yeah, well, it's related to adding employees. Please. And, but I'm, if we're going to talk about this later and there's a more appropriate time, you can let me know. Um, what I want to know is that I had sent Lonnie uh, um, a question on page I-6 of our budget booklet that basically says um, it leads me to think that in order to keep funding public works people, we're going to have to begin to access the 2020 um, sales tax money, and I want to make sure that that is not what that statement really means we are going to do. Commissioner, you referenced uh, I-6. I-6, and it's in the middle of the uh, page under capital funding. And the last paragraph says, securing the capital projects associated with the sales tax extension is of vital interest to maintaining the staffing levels. So the question is, is are we taking from 20... 19 blueprint funding in order to keep pace with uh with the staffing level there uh, we're we are i have not seen the email all right so. and i have i know i'm sorry about that and i guess i'm looking at for lonnie um the lonnie out today oh is he yeah oh, i God. think i can help you he picked it. a bad day to be away i mean my goodness yeah. <laughs> Um, the, you have a really, really long email that should have gone to all commissioners, but you didn't get it until this morning. And basically what it's saying is that for a number of years, we've depended on sales tax, gas tax, and other issues to fund a lot of our uh, projects. And that there are times, there have been times in the past when, um, due to our own limited capital budget, right? There really was not enough for a full staff to do, and no I think lawyer. that's what you're you're getting at. Yes. Basically, we now are moving into one of those phases where we are gearing up, um, due to the sales tax projects, uh, we're gearing up to start doing a lot more engineering type and project design type projects, and some of those we'll be doing in house instead of uh, contracting them out. Okay. Um, and so that's that was really. And uh, your question was, are we adding or eliminating staff, or are we dependent no, on? a couple things. First, and I realize we're not adding an engineering staff, and I did see that. I, I just now found the answer to the email. But um, my interest was that we were adding staff when it clearly said, in order to keep these folks busy, we need to begin to access, and I believe it says access. Anyway, the point is that I just don't want to, I want to be clear that we're not beginning to bond sales tax projects for the 2020. I think you all have given us direction that you did not wish to go that that route at this point. So we're not. That you is not in the plan. You can see why I'm questioning. I mean, it basically it, it says securing capital projects associated with sales tax is of vital interest, and that's why I mm -hmm. was concerned. Yeah, I don't think that that. 
I think you're making the jump that that means that we would be doing the bonding, but it doesn't. So with our existing staff, we'll be able to go ahead and start doing that engineering work mm -hmm. also? Yes. Okay. And we still have money coming in from the 20, from the Blueprint 2000 right. to every year for this reason. I think that, and you know, you hear me every year say, We've got to have more money invested in the city. And even in another sentence in Gabe's um, narrative, it basically says, you know, we're ignoring this. And, and I think you mentioned aging infrastructure in the beginning of your comment. So we're, this is a, a problem that has existed since 2000 as far as the diversion of, this, of what was used before to fund that department. And we're going to have to come up with another way, obviously. Um, I mean, basically, the citizens have spoken, and they've chosen the projects they want. And this year, I think we had a great process to get that accomplished. Um, but that doesn't mean that we as a city don't have to figure out how we're going to continue to do the things that aren't on the list of blueprint projects. So um, what's the plan? That's my question. I haven't seen the email. Let me... Let me go back and we'll bring back an answer of July 7th on, on what the plan is. Yes, and we have several options that we're going to have to discuss here today as far as, as far as just funding our budget. And I think that, as I've said, year after year after year after year, we've got to address this aging infrastructure issue. And um, so please give that a look and try to figure out how you could get some money in that budget line. Well, one of, I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but maybe it is, Heath, for you to talk about. We really have uh, done a little bit more this year, as the commission has indicated. We've been very concerned, too, about our limited um, capital plan. Right. And this year, I asked staff to really take a look, a closer look at what we could do to not only increase the uh, capital budget over the five-year period, but to look at what we might be able to move up into this year, and I think that he, at the appropriate time, will go into Yeah, that. We're, we're actually okay. about to That's about good. to get into Going to the capital okay. budget. Before yeah, you right. do, I saw Commissioner uh, Ziffer, and, oh, well, Commissioner Maddox. Uh, Ziffer, did, did you have a question? I'm just really oh, brief before your question. We did not preclude bonding sales tax issues. We precluded some of them, but not all of them. We had a separate meeting on that, so I, I didn't want us to jump to the point where we won't be bonding any sales tax, future sales tax issues. To be discussed. Um, so um, from the project standpoint, we're adding staff to kind of gear back up. Would these have been um, construction projects that typically Blueprint would have done for us in the past? Or I, I guess one of my question is, is, is are we growing a city staff larger when we might be able to have Blueprint, which is clearly between the city and county, be able to do these projects for us with the staff they already have in place. I don't. Is that an appropriate question? I, yes, I, I understand the question, and let me be clear that the the two positions that are, are programmed to be added for public works are to be paid for out of the stormwater, and they're to do yeah. drainage and right away. They're not doing the engineering work of it. Okay. Uh, but but our guidance and our direction is that as these projects that we move forward. Uh, but whether they're blueprint or city projects that we're, we're looking to identify additional resources for capital uh, Which will keep that uh, the, those staff engaged in doing projects um, We have and we'll get to it in a moment But I'll go ahead and say we we have added an additional 500,000 for roadway resurfacing um, it, We'd like to add more if we can identify it's, it Right, it's not very much. It's not a lot of money. I mean it is a lot of money, but for what we need to do that's Great. just not a whole it, lot of money it's, uh, it, the proposed budget in front of you, what it does is it starts to set the groundwork that we can continue to build upon this year after year. So it's, it's, it's a little step this year, and we hope to continue to grow that uh, uh, in the near future. Um, let me do this. Let me work with Public Works, and let's get a, a, a full response to both the issues, and we'll, uh, we'll bring that back July 7th. But, but I think to be clear, Commissioner, the, the positions being added in the current operating budget are not in engineering. Right. They're, they're to maintain the stormwater, uh, okay. and they're being funded by stormwater funds. Any, any work on the capital side, for the most part, would not be reflected on the operating budget other than as an offset, and it would be capitalized in those particular projects. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank Great. You. Commissioner Richardson. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, and as you know, this is my first budget cycle, and so I'm kind of learning as I go. But uh, before we go into the capital budget, I, I did have two requests that have come to me within the last couple of days, uh, organizations in the community that are requesting funding. And so my question is, uh, is this an appropriate time to? I think what we'll do, if, we if, it, if it's okay, we're gonna do the capital budget and then we'll circle back around because I think there are a number okay. of questions okay. on the general budget. All right. Yeah, we, we do have uh, several items on sort of an unresolved list or we're still working on and, and okay. that'll probably be a good time to talk about those. Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the slide uh, that's up on the screen, that is, uh, does give an indication of which departments are spending money on capital projects next year. Uh, obviously, the, the big portions are electric and underground, and we do have uh, a fire, police, parks and recreation. And these are the sources that the general government uh, is, is picking up 7%. Uh, you know, we were able to identify existing funds to reallocate and reprogram to, to a lot of projects. And some of those major projects, the complete listing obviously is in the budget book. Uh, we have changed the budget format of the capital so you can see not only the, the project expense but also the funding source available for the project. The, the, the big ones, uh, and this may be a good time to talk about the, the body-worn cameras for police, uh, they're going after a grant uh, to, to purchase the cameras, and as part of that grant request, we will be funding the needed infrastructure as far as servers uh, to store the, the camera equipment. Uh, we, we have increased the roadway resurfacing uh, by a half a million this year, and we'll look to increase that in future. Obviously, we've got some um, uh, ball fields and tennis court lighting. We've got some aging infrastructure there. Uh, we've got money in the budget uh, next year and continuing forward to replace the lights, to upgrade them, uh, and, and to continue to make those facilities uh, world-class facilities. So, um, uh, Commissioner Maddox, I know you have a question on the... Uh Body camera. I, I also have a question on that, so we'll go ahead and answer uh, any questions on the general government capital project request. Uh, my question is, what grants are are they going out for in the body cameras? You're looking for the grant title. It's uh, it's just a Department of Justice grant. Department of Justice. The, the Bureau of Justice. The B, BJA grants. So what? That's what I brought that up earlier at a commission meeting to uh, uh, for us to apply for. What's the total cost, and then what is our match? Should we get it for the first year? Good morning. Good the morning. Total total cost is I've just seen, under one point two million dollars. The we have to match fifty percent of it. The, so we, we submitted the grant application last night for a total of $593,000 with our $600,000 match. Okay. So it's basically a 50-50. And, and it's about a two-year implementation process between the grant process, training, development of the policies, researching different equipment, the testing evaluation phase, and then implementation throughout the agency. And that's for 400 cameras to so everybody and the police department, including some of our civilian employees, like our parking enforcement technicians, since they have a lot of contact with the public as well, would be outfitted with a camera. Man, it's a lot of money, half a million bucks. I think my biggest concern is the unanswered questions that exist throughout the, the society related to all this. Who's gonna redact these? Who, what, what, where do the privacy issues come up? Um, I mean, where are you gonna, they said the grant would deal with where you're gonna store all this information, how long are you going to keep it? And I guess, I wish that we had gone forward with maybe a pilot where we tried them in certain instances or certain situations or a portion of. Um, how are you gonna, you're gonna need, it's gonna take some staff time Yes. I mean, how are you going to protect the public's privacy rights? Well, we, we, we have a group that's working on that now, and those are considerations. Uh, the Police Sector Research Forum released a, a full study a few months ago, about a 100-page guide. Uh, we also have the IACP model policies and recommendations that, that we're evaluating, uh, obviously with some of the legislation that's been addressed to, as far as 
you know, privacy and when things can be released and whether or not. We do have a small number of body cameras right now that are assigned to like our traffic unit, some of our investigators for when conducting interviews. And right now what we do is we have a standard scale uh, a schedule that matches okay. not only the public records statute, but also obviously our work with the state attorney depending on the seriousness of the case, things like that, with statute of limitations, which determines how long that video is stored. And the, actually the, the city's match of the grant would fund the storage. The, uh, the grant actually will fund the cameras, the training, that part of it, and the, the money from the city side will fund the uh, on-site storage, which should, based on ISS's uh, estimate, should last somewhere about five to seven years. Should sustain so us. the 600000 is... Is the storage fee. Is the storage. Is what the, is the ongoing cost outside of... So there's, that's a six, seven-year yes. for storage. Is there any other ongoing cost well, occurring? It'll be... Uh, Part of the, the grant includes the maintenance and warranty for the first few years of the cameras. Obviously, as technology changes in shelf life and replacement, that'll, you know, replacement equipment is always an ongoing issue, regardless of what it is. So those will have to be replaced over time. Cameras will get damaged, they'll, they'll break, and then you'll have new technology that come out and they'll get outdated. Just Mr. through Mayor, planned I'd like, obsolescence. I'd like to flag body cameras. Okay. And I'd put a flag on that too. Uh, could I, I wanted to ask one other question. Um, and this is really from legal staff. So I'm mad at my neighbor, and I want to go and find out every time you've ever filmed him doing anything wrong or had any interaction with police. So I have, what I'm trying to get at is, um, I'm just, I'm not really mad at my neighbor. Yeah. So neighbor, wherever you are. Um, I wanted to just clarify exactly what kind of access the public has to these films. I mean, can someone just get up and say, well, I want to see everything you got on Nancy Miller or anybody not, Well, else? not everything. They will be subject to the same Florida public records law that every other interaction so I is. It's, you know, right now, in-car camera videos, they're public records. Mm -hmm. uh, the body cameras that we have now, it's no different than when we go into a house and, and do an investigation, mm -hmm. all that documentation. Now, there are certain protections that the legislature is putting in place. Right. Um, I, I'll be attending the, the police chief's conference in about a week and a half. Okay. There's a full day session on the legal issues and ramifications. And, and that's one of those things, too, as we've gone around the community and had different discussions that I've discussed with different groups of there, there is a trade off here that, yes, obviously it pro provides for a whole lot more transparency with our interactions with the public and the public's interactions with us. But there are some privacy trade-offs and, and one of the things that, you know, I, you know, I try to do it in a joking manner of, you know, we go into your house and you had a bad laundry day and all your laundry sitting on the couch because it hasn't been folded and put away yet. Someone does a public records request, they may see that. But there's also a lot more intimate things that someone may see too if they do that request. There, there, there is a trade-off here. But as there's would, the wouldn't technology. it be if you entered homes though, wouldn't the reg be that they have to be turned off? No, no, sir. The legislature so though, I, I thought that maybe I'm confused they were, about what they're, I read they're talking about doing. I thought that. they did domestic violence and some other issues like they're, that. And that those, those things are already exempt on public records law. Right. You know, the domestic violence information gets redacted, uh, sexual assault cases get redacted, but. What about hospitals? Get, Depending on how it will fall in, but there's a whole list under Florida 19, uh, 119 where thing, information and, and personal information is redacted. These would fall under those same umbrellas unless legislature decides to expand those. I thought they mm -hmm. didn't. They do something they did, this year. Maybe. I thought they did. Well, that's, and that's one of the things. I'll, I guess I'll be getting the updated leg legislative updates and everything else. Like I said, in about a week and a half at the, at the Chiefs Conference. I think there are some updates about right. when you enter the home and also because of HIPAA, when you go into hospitals, so on and so forth. Well, but, but uh, you have to realize, too, then, if, the, if there's a mandate that cameras are going to be turned off, the public needs to be aware of that so the, they have the understanding of that they're not going to be filming everything. I don't think it was turned off. I think it was just protected well, from and, protected and, from and, and those disclosure. Are, those are right. protected under public records law now. Those are exemptions. There were some additions that right. they implemented, as right. I recall. I, so. uh, Commissioner uh, Richardson. Wait, thing. one last I'm question sorry. on the cameras. Um, and you brought this up, and so I'm following it up. <laughs> dashboard cameras. You don't have dashboard cameras in all the cars now, do you? We never have. We have about 27 to 30 that are still working. Right. But Again, that's through, not nearly all of them. Oh, no, not even. That's about maybe 10 percent well, See, and that's a little vehicles. bit higher on my priority list really mainly because of the last four years it's been relevant but so to be discussed yeah. in the future. Commissioner Rich, yeah. Thank you uh, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I would suggest that we're not 
plowing new ground here. And I, I think no. in terms of transparency, uh, just based on all of the incidents that we've seen over the country, where, where had we not relied, had to rely on people with cell phone video cameras, none of this would have been captured. And so I, I think it's a, a fantastic technology. Other communities have implemented it with great success, and, and I would certainly like to uh, see us do the same thing here in Tallahassee. I think it's a good thing to help promote the transparency of our, our interactions and obviously enhance the documentation of any interaction sure. that we have with the public, both positive and negative. Yeah, and, and, it, I, and I think... It builds on what we're doing with the procedural justice and, and fair and impartial policing training as well. It's just a, an additional component. Yeah, and, and I think as we go forward, certainly there are going to be issues of privacy, and that will be up to the legislature. Over the years, the legislature has dealt with issues of, of privacy and those things that are exempt from the public records every year as we've gone forward as we get additional information. And so I, I would assume that they would do the same thing. And, and we'll uh, continue, obviously, to, to monitor with that and, and work through the Chief's Association and, and keep up to date. Um, in addition, we'll con continue to work with, you know, PERF and the ICP to model best practices around the country and let's sure. learn from other programs. Yeah. Um, well, one, I want to join uh, Commissioner Richardson's comment about uh, the fact that I think this is, uh, you know, a sign of 21st century yes. policing. I mean, the, this is going to be standard issue equipment. If, yes, for, for sure. Yes, um, and in a large, um, you know, uh, way, a lot of our policing tactics have really not caught up with I think how society, you know, is is now conducting itself. And I think the evidence of that is pretty clear. Anytime you turn on the the news and observe these stories across the country, um, you know, probably a year ago you had a situation where an officer was telling, you know, a citizen to turn off their phone and they were recording in broad daylight only because there was some misinterpretation of how the laws applied and what is a public space on and so forth. Um, I did want to note, I got to note that the um, the bill passed this year and it was SB 248. And I guess it'll be signed into law, but it does make uh, camera recordings or portions that are of confidential and exempt from public disclosure if the recording is taken within the interior of a private residence, within the interior of a facility that offers health care, right. mental health care, or social services, or a place that is otherwise reasonably considered private right. um, uh, is the law that passed. So I think, right. I think we'll still have to reckon with some of these there, disclosures. With any new technology, there's going to be some Absolutely. growing pains, sure. and like I said, we'll keep up with, obviously, the court cases and, you know, through our legal advisor and, and with the city attorney's office and constantly monitor and make sure that we keep up to date on the, the changes and the best practices. Yeah, and then on the whole statute of limitations piece, because, you know, for instance, with our road cameras, I think they're on loop. I don't even think we, so, <laughs> and by way of helping to prevent sort of this barrage of, of requests for um, those recordings. Um, but even in this case, if you're not dealing with, let's say, evidence for the purpose of a crime, you all could set your own internal policy, right, for how long you would necessarily keep a recording. What we we'll do is because they are considered public record, right. uh, the documentation. So first we'll follow the schedule that, that's established in 119, and then what, what, typically what we do is we add a buffer time just to make sure that something isn't cut short. Right. Of a few days to make sure that nothing is automatically deleted without making sure that we covered that time frame in case something comes up later on that it's needed for. Right. And then what we do is, though, what we have right in place right now is a policy that if there's, if it's related to a call, if it's related to an internal complaint or a citizen complaint, then it gets flagged in the system and preserved until the completion of that investigation. Or if there's litigation expected, then obviously it gets preserved as, as well until the, the, that time frame is up. But it isn't necessary. Well, certainly not necessarily into perpetuity. No, 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 particularly sure. information that's no, not we, the, evidence and related to an, an active. Right. No, every, everything has a time frame to where it gets purged. Got it. And then I, I was visited, and I understand these folks visited you too, um, um, and actually I, I don't have a card for them, but they bought these case studies um, looking at Salt Lake City and Boston and I believe um, New York uh, where um, – body cameras were used, but they were really a component of a much broader sort of public safety system. And um, my question to you is whether or not we have considered uh, are there other foundational elements we should be adding um, the, um, uh, infrastructure-wise? Uh, to use one example, I understand that the Boston police use these really uh, – high intense cameras to track down the two perpetrators who, you know, used the bomb at the, the, the Boston Marathon uh, a few years ago. Um, that there was a back frame that body cameras and other elements were sort of connected to, mainly 
video um, that allowed not only for the recording of an incident, but say you got a call on one of the D streets and one of these cameras were able to go um, one, because of, I understand that there's some sound technology that can triangulate when a gun is fired, yes. almost mm -hmm. to a low, you know, to, to very within specific, a certain, within a certain distance, yes. right, within a specific range, and that you could pull up the camera for this area, um, initiate recording, or you, you might have it already recording, so you could pull up data, and then when you dispatch officers to a particular location, you, you send them there with much more information. I'm not foreclosed on, frankly, how I feel completely about uh, that. that, that you're, that's a whole lot of another civil rights yeah, yeah, surveillance, yeah, surveillance but, but the truth is, is that in Europe, that these cameras are deployed everywhere, uh, uh, oh, yes. in public spaces, that is. Right. Uh, New York, the same thing. There's nothing that you can expect that you do on the street to be kept private necessarily because you're in a public domain and it's done in the, in the, in the, in the interest of, of, of public safety. I only, again, I'm not foreclosed on my opinion on this, but I do want to make sure that we are taking actions that are component parts of a larger strategy and not necessarily in and to themselves right. the end goal, right? So if body cameras is uh, is uh, um, in, uh, a new tool that we're adding to our arsenal um, to fight crime and keep our community safe, are there ele other elemental pieces that we ought to be including in this conversation that we haven't yet brought to the surface? The, 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 uh, the, we can do as much as the money allows us, uh, to just be perfectly frank. Uh, the, the systems you're talking about, to, to put up cameras around the system, let, let's say that the, the that was the direction of the commission and, and the community supported putting up cameras and, and shot spotter systems, that, that's the system you're talking about that detects the sound and helps triangulate locations. And we invested tens of millions of dollars in that those types of systems uh, obviously they, they would do be a great investigative resource great tool and they help focus response time and investigations and, and things like that um, obviously you know we do have some surveillance technologies that we use based on investigations that we put up for a limited time frame based on you know information that we have and, and to try to capture mm -hmm. you know specific incidents uh, but we don't have things that we just sit up with the hopes of catching something. Mm -hmm. they're, they're there for a targeted reason. Right. Uh, special yes. events, so on and so right. forth. But, but, you know, there, there are a lot of, I mean, for not, depending on how you want to look at it, and like I said, everything's a double-edged sword, there are some technologies out there that, you know, with the investment, you could put up an infrastructure of, of cameras and, and sound detection and things like that that would help network and, and provide for, you know, in some cases a quicker response time or more detailed information as the officers get there, and obviously that would have to be linked to the CDA as well, right. and additional responsibilities for them to evaluate that information and then dispatch officers and, and relay that information. I mean, there's the technology out there, depending on where you're at, what you want to invest, that you can live stream those cameras to officers' mobile computers in their cars, and they can observe that from a distance and see what's going on. I mean, the, yeah, it, so it's, you I, know, we're, we're in the age of the science fiction stuff come to life. Well, I mean, my, my, my point is really not a mm -hmm. question of what it is, you know, doing whatever we can right. uh, afford, but uh, a thoughtful strategy around what makes sense for right. the problems that we face, um, and which obviously have to be vetted through the public appetite. Because right. we, you know, we wouldn't, mm -hmm. just because it's available doesn't mean it's a good idea necessarily for our community or that we're interested in doing it. But um, for, Oftentimes, at least, you know, you see a new technology, a new effort sort of come along and it becomes a one-off. And then a couple of years later, there's something else and it becomes a one-off. And so my request, and again, it may not even be as part of this budget discussion, but as we move forward, is to understand if there's a more complete solution here. Right. Certainly, um, based off what we know, what we know our needs are, where we have hot spots, so on and so forth, uh, that will allow us to make really smart investments that we don't find ourselves picking up the next toy a couple of years from now and then running down that road. Um, absolutely, and that's why, you know, we, had, you know, we tried to kind of look at the, the body cameras thoughtful, and, and I think that, you know, some of the technologies you're talking about serve a different purpose than the body cameras. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, the body cameras' primary purpose really is to record our, our, our police citizen encounters and interactions and create that neutral documentation. Mm -hmm. To, to make sure that we have as much impartial information when we have to evaluate what happened. Right. Um, their primary purpose isn't to capture evidence, although they will do that as an ancillary benefit right, right, right. Uh, for you know, investigations and, and other things. And um, I guess what I'm thinking right. of is if there are preventive tactics or tactics right. that 
have the success, right. uh, demonstrate a success of discouraging right. um, certain activities. Absolutely. Commissioner Maddox. Uh, I just want to put in my two cents on, I'm, I'm familiar with shot spotter technology. I don't think that we need that in the city of Tallahassee because with rare exception, we're catching who's shooting. So I don't know why we would want to spend money to put out uh, technology that recognizes the sound of gunfire and uh, outside of the Markel case, which we all agree is different circumstances. We haven't had a whole lot of unsolved gun violence cases. Uh, when it comes to body cameras, I don't have objection to the body cameras. I have objection to the 600,000. So I'm looking at, uh, and again, body cameras are, are to document police interaction, right? So our, our first line of defense would be to have good training of our police officers, good hiring of our police officers, good retention of our good police officers, and discipline on, on those that perhaps shouldn't be doing police work. And if we did those things, we wouldn't have a need for body cameras. So we're, my concern is $600,000 for body cameras, what I think will be $350,000 ongoing for the gun violence, in addition to the new officers, uh, and, and a 27% increase in property taxes. So I think, you know, budgets are about priorities, so I, I think we've got to make choices here. For me, I'd rather see the dollars go into new personnel than to go into the body cameras. <clears throat> Any other um, questions, thoughts on that, on the, uh, I believe it's the capital piece of it? All right. Mr. Richardson. Uh, again, it, tell me if I'm, I'm introducing this in an inappropriate time, but in terms of the capital projects, uh, Mr. Mayor, one of the issues that is of, of, was brought to my attention and is, is of really high concern for me is the fire department response time and, and their need for additional fire stations in the city. Uh, according to figures that I have that were provided to me uh, by Chief Gaines and his staff, in the area of the county uh, where there are the highest number of calls, I mean extraordinarily higher number of calls than other areas of the county, the response times are higher. Uh, and so I really want us to begin to address that issue uh, as immediately as possible. Uh, and that would involve locating a fire station along the Lake Bradford Road corridor, because that's where the majority of calls are, are coming from. I mean, by far. Um, and yet the, the response times are, are beyond what the uh, standard is uh, for response times. Uh, in that area. Got it. Um, do you all want to address um, where you normally handle the capital projects for fire? I assume that as part of the study that was recently conducted, the future needs of fire were included in that. But if you could speak to that for Commissioner Richardson, please. Yeah, real briefly, I mean, as we contemplate what the next five years the fire services fee will, will bring in, the capital is part of that uh, analysis. Um, but what I would like to do is to, is to go back and talk to Chief Gaines and, and, and answer this question directly at the next uh, uh, July 7th budget workshop. Okay. But again, that uh, all the capital needs were, were contemplated as we developed the fee. And, and not that we can't make adjustments or changes to that over the time. I just want to talk to him and, and see if we can't come up with a strategy. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly hope that we would because when I look at these numbers, it's very disconcerting that you've got the, the, by far the larger number of service calls in one area of the community, and yet in that same area the response times are higher than in other areas. And so I, I really want to see us address that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Um, again, the, the, the complete list of capital projects is, uh, is available in the budget. Um, the ones that we have listed up here are just sort of the, the, the more expensive one, the major ones. Uh, are, are there any other questions on capital projects at this time? We can always come back to it. Come back. 
Thank you. Okay. I have a was, was there a flag to Commissioner Richardson's uh, concern? I'll s second the flag. Uh, where we kind of want to draw a conclusion today is, is on some of the unresolved issues. I'm going to kind of take some of these out of order here because uh, they're all not on the, on the same level. The, the economic development portal, which was talked about at the city commission retreat, uh, we just haven't been able to identify a, a project amount, so we're still working on that. We will bring that back. It's not completely off the table. We just don't, we don't know where it is. The same thing for Governor's Walk. Uh, we, uh, June 24th, they should be bringing an item back to the Short uh, Range Target Issue Committee. Uh, to, until we determine what that scope of that project is, the price tag is, is undeterminable at the moment, but that is still moving forward and we still hope to come back. The same thing for the uh, Council on Cultural and Arts. Uh, they put in a request uh, at the direction of the City Commission this year. We asked that outside agencies who want additional funding to sit, submit a letter to contact us. They asked for 40000 above and beyond what we normally give them, but we are currently working with the county and the TDC, uh, and we, we hope to have that resolved by the time we come back on July 7th. Uh, <clears throat> The other item, St. Francis Wildlife Foundation, the Economic Development Council, uh, Legal Services, and MOLAB, currently we do not have any resources identified to fund those. So in the proposed FY16 budget, they are not included at this time. Uh, obviously, we still have some moving pieces when it comes to revenue uh, and <coughs> expenditures even. We, we have yet to get an update on our health care cost. Uh, but these are items that are still outstanding at the moment, and we'd be happy to, to answer questions on these or take some direction on them as well. And this would be probably a good time to talk about the additional funding request. Great. Commissioner Azifer. Yeah, I have, um, I have um, sincere concerns about not being able to find the funds for legal services in Northeast Florida. I mean, these are folks that have no place else to turn for legal assistance. And um, from um, what I've read and had the discussions, I've had the cutbacks that they've already had with staffing and such over the last couple of years. They're at a point where, quite frankly, I can't imagine it's not supporting in some fashion. So I'm not sure if I have support from anybody else on the commission. But mm -hmm. and, and, and I know that this is the moment where you turn to me and say, Commissioner, you need to find the money. Well, I'm turning it back to you, staff. Please try to find the money, because I think legal services in North Florida is something that we need to support. <clears throat> the other one I have, which is not even on this list, and it's a conversation I had today, it had to do with, and I know we've done a great job, and they're very complimentary, and I agree, and that is what we've been able to do at our Animal Services Center. But evidently, the, um, the um, lost fan, the intake person, um, and I know that they're trying to find money also from the county on this, um, and it's, I think, around 20-some-odd thousand dollars. Um, it seems to me that position um, is so vitally important because that's the f first person that anybody goes to our animal service center, sees and interacts with, and unless that functions properly, um, I think an awful lot of other things break down, so I don't know if there's support there or you've had any conversations, but that's something I'd like to support, too. I think you got my... Duly, duly noted. Um, and I wanted to say, on legal services in North Florida, um, the the impact they have on crime prevention and recidivism is just is statistically proven. So we're in a situation now where we're looking to spend a significant amount of money on really addressing our crime and violence situation in our city. So that clearly, to me, falls right in line with that, and I would really hope to see that funding go away. Um, if you want to talk to me later, I've got some suggestions as to where you can get this money. And, um, and that, and what I was going to suggest to you later would be also include the money for Council on Culture and the Arts. That's very important to me. But I want to also second Commissioner Ziffer's request to find funding to keep the um, intake coordinator. This is a person that not only has the, a very important job, but has the personality to do the work. I mean, it's someone that, in, that interacts with folks um, and works with them, many of them, to keep, help them keep their animal and show them some alternatives, provide food for them. I mean, she just does a lot to, to make um, the numbers on our animal services center <clears throat> improve the way we've seen them improve since we've been focused on that over the last couple of years. So um, I would also flag that. Mr. Mayor. Commissioner Richardson. Thank you. I, I want to third 
I guess if that's appropriate, uh, Commissioner uh, Ziffer's remarks about legal services. Um, it, that is a lifeline for many in our community. I mean, I, we pride ourselves on having access to the courts for legal redress. And for many, without the services of legal services, uh, they wouldn't have that opportunity. And so um, I know that uh, this is an issue for legal services statewide. Their funding source has, has almost been depleted. The Chief Justice of our Supreme Court has commissioned a task force uh, to look at this issue and to address funding for legal services across our state. And in my conversation with Mary, um, uh, it's my understanding that this would be a bridge for them or could be a bridge for them uh, to get them through this next fiscal year until recommendations come back from that task force. So I would certainly want to see us support that issue as well. Um, the couple of other issues that I have, um, Mr. Mayor, if it's appropriate at this time to bring those up, uh, is the, uh, uh, and, I, and I brought this up before, the Florida Out, Disabled Outdoors Association, FDOE, and, and for full disclosure, as, I, as I've done before, uh, I've been a longtime uh, board member of that organization, uh, and it's because of my affinity for working with persons with disabilities. Uh, that's been uh, a passion of mine since my days as a school psychologist working in the Gadsden School District, and I've served on the boards and volunteered uh, for a number of organizations that provide programs and services for persons with disabilities. And I would like to see us, uh, what, what they're looking to do is to partner with our Parks and Recreation Department, and they've submitted a proposal here, uh, to provide um, uh, recreational activities uh, for persons with disabilities. I've talked to Ashley. She said we are doing some things uh, but I think a partnership with FDOA could tremendously uh, expand the programs and services that we offer uh, to persons with disabilities in our community uh, and, and enhance their quality of life. It also serves as a respite uh, for parents uh, who have the challenge of a child or even an adult uh, with disabilities. And so their, their request is um, for a partnership with uh, neighborhood and community services to provide those opportunities for persons in our community uh, that have uh, specific disabilities. The other is from the African Caribbean Dance Theater uh, that is a cultural organization here in the community and they're requesting uh, $20,000 from the city uh, towards their operational cost. And so I'd like to submit those and have staff, Mr. Mayor, take a look at uh, whether we can uh, provide funding for those organizations or develop a partnership with the FDOA through our uh, Neighborhood and Parks program. Thank you. Commissioner Maddox. Uh, I just want to go on the record that we're going outside of our processes every time we do this. I know. Uh, and uh, I am a big fan of legal services in North Florida. Uh, and I think they do outstanding work. I'm a big fan of FDOA. Uh, I, I'm not as familiar with African dance, uh, but I'm sure they do great things. We set up a process many years ago because individual groups came to the commission each year during budget, and we would make a decision whether to fund those groups, both in human services and in cultural. Uh, then uh, it was a popularity contest over which commissioners were on which boards uh, and who brought the most people to the commission meetings for budget workshops as to who got funded. We found that system to be unworkable and put in a, the human services uh, system and the, and the COCA cultural arts system that we have today. So now we fund those two entities and those two entities go through a very thoughtful process with grants. Recently, we are, are departing from that process and making individual decisions that to fund programs, no matter how worthy they may be, uh, even those that are facing emergencies. And I think it's a horrible precedent. 
So as much as I love those organizations, and I'm looking at the people I love out in the audience, I'm going to vote no, because I think it's uh, when you start down this slippery slope, what's going to happen is we'll dissolve the human services partnership, we'll dissolve the cultural arts process as well, and it'll be back to a popularity contest. And I don't think you want that, because the folks that I'm looking at are in the smaller category from the ones that used to get funded in much larger numbers. Uh, so. I just want to put it out there now. I'll be against it when it comes. Mr. Mayor. Just, uh, yes, sir. Uh, just a couple things. Um, I mean, we've kind of gone down that slippery slope already with what we did for um, uh, Second Harvest. Uh, and that's what a lot of the organizations in the community are talking about. So we've already started in that direction. I agree, though, with you, Commissioner Maddox. We do have a process, and maybe we need to you know, take another look at at, at what we're doing in that respect, but we've already gone there. Um, secondly, in terms of FDOA, they do get some funding through the Community Human Services Partnership Program, but what we're looking at there is a broader, more long-term <clears throat> partnership with Parks and Rec, uh, where they would, would work along with staff uh, in that department to offer uh, recreational activities for a group of our citizens that currently are not being provided those services. Um, right now they do it on an annual basis through sports ability and some of the limited programs that they do at Miracle Field. Uh, but what we're looking at is something long term year round that could be offered to persons in our community uh, with disabilities that, you know, but for programs that are provided uh, through FDOA, uh, they wouldn't have those opportunities. Um, I, I met with uh, Mary as well, and she is a very, very capable advocate, and they do awesome work for the community. But I did express in that meeting that I was going to be very, very hard-pressed to move them outside of the uh, outside of the CHSP process. And, and part of it is, and I have voted to move groups outside of that process before to include the emergency funding that we did. And the lens that I try to apply, and maybe imperfectly, is one, extreme emergencies. Um, and then two, those agencies that don't otherwise have a home either within our CHSP process or within our arts process. And I'm not sure, and I'll have to go back and look at each of the groups, but I'm almost certain that each of them either have a place setting in the human services or in the arts category, which means they have gone through the competitive process uh, to receive designated funding and have been either awarded um, uh, an amount, and the amount may be insufficient <clears throat> for the need, and I, I wouldn't doubt that, uh, but they have gone through a contested and a, and a competitive process. Um, what we're doing with regard to the general increase in funding, the, 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 the increase that's being proposed at the budget for human services, I think takes us in a good direction because I think the needs are, as has been de demonstrated, you know, pretty, pretty high. And we know them because we're trying to address them in a lot of other ways. Um, um, so, I, you know, with, with that as my own personal barometer, one, the institutions that don't have a home in any of our other granting processes. And uh, while I respect your uh, position, Commissioner Maddox, I, I do think extreme emergencies warrant um, consideration by this board, whether or not it, it requires us going outside of that. But to me, it doesn't appear evident uh, in the cases that have been presented, <clears throat> the, 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 the fact that an extreme emergency exists in any of the cases. So um, my predecessor, occasionally I would hear him say, uh, I think, what was it, fungible, right? Oh, yes. Right? Money. Yes. So um, and I agree with everything you're saying, but, you know, within our budget, we always seem to find, and we know this, um, sponsorship opportunities and funds for that, or we do table sponsors, things like that. So if this doesn't happen to work out this way, I would certainly hope for us to look at other ways, because I know they do Jazz for Justice and they do things like that, where we may be able to find some funding that ends up in the same way, but maybe it goes through a different, because clearly we do have things in the city government where money goes through different mm -hmm. forms and fashions and different pathways, um, because I am 
very much concerned about the um, ability for certain people in our community to have good legal advice. And this is the place where, in many cases, it's the last resort. And as you said, Commissioner, um, in many cases, this keeps people out from going back to jail, which costs all of us a considerable amount more money. So um, whatever happens in this, I hope we can find a way to support legal services in North Florida some way through this government. Um, and, Commissioner, just to, um, to make you privy to the comment that I made to Mary, which was um, depending upon how the CHSP process worked out, I had asked to see just the zip codes, the areas in which they tend to have their clients pull from. And oddly enough, there's great density in a lot of these areas in which their clients come from. So depending on what happens with how we decide to move forward on the, on the CHSP funding process, there may be another way in which to go. And I'll just say a little bit more about that. And I know we haven't come to a conclusion, but I wanted to raise it back for our consideration because I also just reading the paper and looking at the county commission meeting, um, see that they're also contemplating a mini grant process to speak to some of the very specific issues that our community is facing on crime, violence, so on and so forth. It's sort of similar to the idea that I raised the last time we were at the budget discussion table, which is a mini grant process that speaks very specifically to a set of uh, a set of issues. Um, the, the, I made a little list of some of those areas of emphasis, pulling from our um, application for the promise zone. Some of those areas that were identified there were anti-poverty relief programs because the area has 69%, almost 70% folks who live in below the poverty level. There was the infant mortality and more broadly, the adverse health conditions that existed in the, in the area. Obviously, gang violence reduction and, and high violent crime. Job creation, 30% unemployment in the area. So strategies that speak to that. Uh, and then there was the housing piece, and I've seen a number of emails that have, have been lifted on that, but basically over-concentration, over-density, not enough diversity of housing options in the particular area. So the idea is, is that, it, uh, um, and it looks like the county may be moving in the direction to segment mo some money for a mini-grant process. Um, my recommendation or request would be that as part of the total lifting of the boat, for our human services funding, the 450 roughly that we are considering, that if we can't do everything in a mini grant, that we do a portion of that in a mini grant process, that we state very specific areas where we want agencies to apply to provide relief in those areas. So if, if you were going to say infant mortality is my thing, and we knew based on our application that you've got high levels, uh, extreme high levels of infant mortality in an area, you would make application and say, these are the strategies that we're going to implore to address infant mortality within this area. And then, presumably, within the CHSP process, separate from the normal grant process, uh, a team of evaluators will say, there's merit to this, here's your grant for that, and here's a timeline by which we expect you to bring back some resolution on that. Um, um, I also had a brief conversation with the, the President of the United Way, who also mentioned um, that uh, Vince Long had talked to her about whether or not they would also be interested in a partnership that moved in this direction, and she indicated to him at that time that they would be. Um, so there may be some synergies that are gathering here, but um, it's still to be foreclosed on, but I went down that road to, to get to your particular point, which is there may be other ways to slice uh, slice the pie. If, um, if I could say, um, some might argue that we would be on some level picking winners and losers, but the fact of the matter is with some of the issues that we have in our community today, I support it 100% exactly what you're suggesting. Shake that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I, I just, in terms of the FDOA, what, in terms of uh, some closure on that, what, what I would like to request is that maybe we have staff uh, meet with them and see how maybe within the current budget of parks and recreation that we can accomplish what we're trying to accomplish there. And if not, that maybe there might be some additional funding uh, that might be requested. I, I would support that conversation. I, don't, I haven't seen, uh, obviously, what, what uh, the documents you're referencing with regard mm -hmm. to their proposal. Um, one thing I was impressed by, by one of the cities we visited, was uh, the way in which um, um, access was made available for all differently abled individuals and within the parks and recreations uh, space. Um, again, not having the benefit of uh, the material, I think it would be worth 
at least exploring what that might look like uh, within the confines of our existing budget infrastructure. Yeah. Commissioner Miller. Um, I wanted to go back to COCA. Yes. You know, this is a, a, a transitional year where we're going from funding a certain way to funding in a very different way. And while it may seem that there's more money in, on the table, the money is much more narrowly defined. Now, those lines, I know are, you're, you said you had been discussing with all of that with um, Lee Daniels and the county at Visit, Visit Tallahassee, and I'm sure that Audra has been working through all that too. But I would like to have, before the end, by the next workshop, a piece presented to us on exactly how COCA's operating budget falls into that scenario, how the um, that moving film that Chucha Barber did that showed us the, the way that um, a lot of groups wouldn't be funded, how, they're gonna, how those needs are going to be addressed. And we had to bring that film back. I can't remember whether I saw that at Tourist Development or whether I saw that I've here. Seen I've seen it. I haven't yeah, either. Oh, absolutely then. You need to bring it in. And then the question is, what are we doing about all of those organizations that were depicted in the film? Mm -hmm. So Commissioner, I think when you see in that, you'll feel, you know, that there is need to get to the bottom of this as we go forward into this next budget year. Apologies for the interruption. I'm, I'm also, maybe you could bring back a statement of what the problem is, um, because as I understood it, there was, I guess, 400 new thousand that has gone into the process as a result of this, which I view as sort of new stimulus money, uh, if you will. Um, but um, um, the manager briefly told me that maybe that led to another set of problems. And I think different ones of us have access to different information. If we could get a much more complete and rounded view of what is the problem statement, how is this uh, new tourist development the influx money being treated at one point. Commissioner Zifferett made the, uh, the recommendation. I can't remember what the resolution was, but is that the money be used for capital or um, oh, capital projects capital or project. new infrastructure the, stuff. The, um, the cultural plan committee came back with some recommendations on how some different funds should be right. used. Right. So, th but that's, that, that is, uh, those are efforts that they cannot currently fund generally under their current process because it's, you know, almost everything you request goes into direct programming, that kind of thing. Um, so where did that all land and how is that complicating this, um, this scenario. Yeah. Mayor, you're exactly right. That's what I want to know. I want to know exactly how the needs are being met. And one of the, the most important points and, and parameters of this entire discussion is how Visit Tallahassee defines um, right. the marketing efforts because the money is supposed to be used to market and, and how does that um, so do people have to prove they're putting heads in beds because that's the bottom line with Visit Tallahassee, heads in beds. And so is the Theater Tallahassee putting heads in beds when they put on a performance? And there, you know, there are people who live here who actually, in, and we're enriching their lives too by trying to be more supportive of our arts organizations. And so I would like to make sure that those arts organizations that serve all of those, everybody, tourists and residents alike, get what they need is in terms of funding because under the new scenario, some of the people who've been funded in the past may not have ready access in the future. But that's what I'm asking, just what you asked. Sure. Clearly, we need to know how everyone is affected. Commissioner Ziffer. By state statute, those funds are restricted to be used for certain things that draw, as you said, heads and beds. And so it's just want to be clear, it's not the TDC that's making those decisions. They're required by state law for those dollars to be used a certain way. And as a result of that, um, there may be some folks in the past that were able to receive some of the COCA grants that are no longer able to do that because they're more local in nature. Some of those are educational programs and things of that nature. And uh, so there are some um, um, holes now that may exist where funding was available in the past that may not be available now. But I think perhaps, yes, the presentation might be beneficial for all of us sure. to give us a better idea. Do you have another? Just want to lend my support also uh, for what's being asked. I, uh, one of the things I ran on was support for the arts and culture in our community throughout our community because I 
I think it's just absolutely important uh, for a community, particularly like Tallahassee, and and, um, and and so I think we should certainly look to support uh, those efforts that are going on in our community to provide arts and culture uh, throughout our community. Right. Um, I just wanted to uh, raise, and I, I don't know if the chief is still uh, in the room or not, that he can address this question, but if you are chief. Um, he is. Great. Uh, I have gotten some feedback from folks saying, you know, um, are we taking a singular approach here by just hiring new officers as a, as a way of answering um, the rise in, um, in crime and in violent crime? And one of the things that um, Deputy Chief Forrest uh, last week explained to me was um, certainly for many of us who are advocates of more community policing practices, uh, one of the inhibitors to being able to do that, particularly when you are short-staffed on the sort of front line, is that officers are spending their time responding to calls, writing reports, to which takes them out of the field. And when they're doing that, they aren't on the street talking to people. They're not in neighborhoods building relationships. They're not doing the community policing practices that I think you believe in and I think this commission has uh, certainly given a lot of voice to. Um, so can you speak to how uh, the addition of these officers will address, I believe, your vision and our, our collective vision of getting more officers on the street, more officers building relationships, that this, while it may appear to be a, you know, a, a solution to you know, police more people and, and arrest more people, really is an attempt to build deeper uh, and deepen relationships with the community that is actually taking us under direction of, of more community policing and not just more bodies on the street for more arrests. Right. I, actually, if you we, we can pull the stats and everything else, if you look, you know, we've actually, our arrests have decreased as we've tried to engage the community more. Uh, last year, our arrests were actually down. The emphasis that, um, as we've all talked about and certainly talked about publicly, is this is about relationships. And relationships are about trust, and the only way to build that is to spend time together. Uh, right now, especially for our patrol officers, who are the ones who have the most frequent contact with the public, the, the vast majority of their time is spent responding to a call, investigating that call, documenting the call, and then going to the next call with very little downtime in between. Can you tell the ratio? Uh, the, uh, the, the, we're, we're estimating uh, the what we did is we based it on there, were, there was a study done in 2002. Uh, that was done, uh, the Police Security Research Forum was hired to do. They estimated at that time that it was about 65% of our time was spent responding to calls. The national best practice is about 50% of an officer's time should be spent calls for service, 50% of unencumbered time to engage the community when they're not in that, some type of crisis. Because if, even if you're in a traffic crash or you're the victim of a crime and an officer comes out and they do everything perfectly, they treat you the right way, they conduct a thorough investigation, write a textbook report. The fact is, is your frame of reference with that officer is still a negative one because you were the victim of something. Something bad happened to you that created that opportunity for the officer to engage. What we're trying to do is create opportunities for officers to engage with the public when something bad hasn't happened. When they're there for no other reason than to say hello, how are you doing? Is there something that you need? What can we do better? Uh, you know, we have a lot of community programs that we run, certainly with the youth, with, you know, TPAL and Defy and our tax student program. Uh, we, have the, you know, the, we have the juvenile civil citation, adult civil citation, which are ways that we give people second chances instead of arresting them. Uh, you know, we, we were just recognized this last year by the Smart Justice Alliance for the adult civil citation program. Uh, you know, so we're doing a lot of things to not make everything about arrest and enforcement, but positive engagement. But the only way to do that is to create the opportunity for officers to spend time when, when people, when they're not, because they haven't called dispatch, right? because they're calling dispatch was an emergency. The 2006 study that was built on the 2002 study estimated that our time spent on calls was about 75% of our time. And um, again, the recommended is 50%. It's 50%. Since then, calls for service have gone up. Geographically, the city has expanded and as I have been painfully learning, and you all are all too aware, to, there really aren't too many straight roads to get from point A to point B. So, you know, as calls for service demands increase, the geography of the city increase, and unfortunately, the nature of the crimes have really kind of shifted from property crimes to violent crimes. You know, violent crimes take more resources. You know, if there's a shooting, you have somebody going to the hospital with the victim. You have, if you have the suspect still on scene, you've got somebody 
with the suspect on scene. You've got officers managing crime scene. You've got officers, so you could have one shooting that takes half your shift up yeah. uh, of your available officers. You know, violent crimes take more officers to respond due to the nature of it, as opposed to a vehicle burglary where one officer goes, they document it. Uh, if we have the ability to get some, you know, forensics and, and dust for punch or something else like that, but it's a, it's a one-person show. Violent crime takes more. So we went from about 67% to about 75%. You know, now we have not done a full workload study assessment. That takes quite a bit of expertise and, and resources, and, you know, we still have some growing pains with the data, with the new CAD system. Uh, but, you know, it's clearly well over 80% just based on the growth of the calls for service, the call volume, and the city's geographical growth. Uh, so the idea is if we can put more officers on patrol. And, you know, last year what we did is we took a number of inside positions, reassigned those duties, and put more officers out on patrol. And that's how we created the second cop squad last year that was dedicated to Southsiders. We took people from the inside, took their administrative duties, reassigned them, and then shifted those responsibilities to help create those opportunities for, for engagement outside of uh, an arrest or a, a stiff, uh, traffic violation or something else. And that cop squad, uh, you've, we've got two. We have two right now currently. That's yes. a total of how many officers? It, it's, uh, when they're fully staffed, it's about 16 officers. So fully staffed of the entire department, only about 16 of our officers. That, 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 that are dedicated full-time to two neighborhoods, but the community policing philosophy is throughout. Absolutely. Every, every officer has that responsibility to engage in building relationships. You know, plus we have the community relations unit that runs the more formal programs with crime prevention. Uh, you know, the TPU and breakfast uh, is this Saturday morning. We do, that, do those quarterly. The homeowner association meetings that we attend, things like that as well. I just think it's important to put a pin in that in that data point that you know, based off you all's estimates and and without precise updated numbers, certainly we can say safely seventy five percent and maybe upwards and then, of eighty percent of officers' time on duty is spent in response and in the process of doing the paperwork to. Uh, a response for call for service, sure. which is out of sync, one, with a community policing model, not because you choose to, but because no. of the capacity question. Um, uh, uh, and, and I think the approach that we're taking uh, is one that hopefully will help to renew the balance that you all are trying to achieve by getting not just those officers who are doing the cop squad, right. but all of our line officers in communities, in relationship with folks, outside of the context of a, resp a response to a call for service. And that's what we're trying to do is to create those opportunities for that, that engagement outside of where someone's in a time of crisis. Right. Yeah. Commissioner yeah. Mr. Mayor, I, th I think it's important for the community to understand that these additional officers, the call for additional officers is not to call for an, an increase in arrest of Absolutely. people in the community. It is for building those relationships and also to be a deterrent. I mean, when you've got officers patrolling neighborhoods and, and communities, it, that in and of, in and of itself uh, can deter uh, crime from happening. Um, but the, the question that I, I had for you, Chief, uh, because you and I have talked about this before as well, have we kept pace uh, in terms of the growth of the community, uh, your staffing level uh, with the per capita population uh, in Tallahassee? No, I, th I think the, the, the budget uh, presentation that we put together kind of demonstrates where we are as far as the growth over the city of the, over the last decade and mm -hmm. and with the population wise and but and that's why we also try to look at it because the population number is in everything and, and that's why we try to look also we look at call calls for volume uh, for calls for service volume excuse me and we also looked at the geography too now you can take a city that's smaller geographically and not have you know, as many calls for service or have more calls for service. You know, we were just up in Chicago uh, last week with the group of the Gun Violence Council, and I s spent some time talking to one of the commanders from, you know, Chicago PD. You know, her area is basically a, a three-by-three square mile, and her contingent of officers is more than we've got in all of Tallahassee for 100 square miles because of call volume. Wow. And her population is less than we have here. Uh, so that's, that's why we try to look at it from different components. It's, it was our response times, it was the calls for service, it was population based and geography, and that's how we're trying to make sure that we're, we're not just picking one number and saying, oh, he, here's our one number that we should benchmark on. We're trying to really make a holistic approach so that way, you know, I'm making a, a good recommendation to, to the manager and to you, and that way the community understands what we're trying to accomplish and why, and it's not just, we're not picking numbers out of thin air. Uh, and, and as a city 
city has grown, uh, just like every other resource, we've done the best we can to keep up with the, the, the increased demands. All right. And, and am I correct in assuming, too, Chief, that if you did have additional staff, we might even be able to go back to establishing substations in those areas where we are having the greatest you know, concerns? Those, you know, substations always make me a little nervous because of the staffing issues, but th those are things that without, you know, those are, uh, we, you know, we've talked about it. Without the, with the staff we have now, there's just not a way to put somebody in a, in a facility where they're available to the public with the hopes of somebody walking in. Right, uh, right now, the idea is the, the best way to ensure that the officers have the opportunity to, to contact is what we've been doing is, you know, we've kind of been shaking our own, our own branches and, and shaking people out where we can from the building and, and getting them out to, to engage. And then also, the, you know, the focus of the 16 positions is patrol work. I mean, that, that's the heart and soul of policing is that fundamental relationship. That's the fundamental service that we provide to the community is crime prevention, relationships, and then unfortunately responding to crimes. And, and that's where the focus has to be. And then, you know, due to the caseload and, and, and you know, the, the workload on their investigators over the last few years is, is why they additional investigators as well. But the intent is to have the people, to have, give the officers time for that engagement. Mr. Maddox? We tried substations 20 years ago, and uh, it was a failure. First of all, we had to staff each one of them, and you didn't see the interaction in the neighborhood that mm -hmm. we we wish for it to be. Uh, I think our best substation comes on four wheels mm -hmm. and, and uh, drives through neighborhoods or, or on motorcycles or bicycles. So I, I would hope that <clears throat> we'd look along those lines. No, the emphasis on oh, – sorry, sir. Go ahead. No, I say the emphasis, that's why the emphasis is on patrol and making sure – that the people you're out, so that way we're not waiting for someone to come to us. If if we can proactively establish relationships, then then that'll go a long way, I think. And, and you know, not just getting information for investigations, but just having the opportunity to help you know recruit more people to attend our youth programs. To, you know, make sure they they take advantage of the the, the programs that are available with our parks and rec because there's so many good services here. You know, some people aren't aware of them or, or don't feel comfortable. But if we can, you know, engage proactively, we, we can deter a lot of what's going on. Commissioner Ziffer. I know this is um, probably hard for the chief to believe, but this isn't a question for him. Um, sorry. We're, we're certainly spending a lot of time on law enforcement today, if you haven't noticed. And this may not be the appropriate time, but I'll ask it before I, so I can just scratch it off my list here. What have we built in the budget for the campaign finance um, refund to taxpayers? Because that's going to be next year. I'm just curious. I know that we've added full time, uh, uh, partial other employee to help with the ethics um, um, situation, but how much have we budgeted for the campaign ref um, you were, refund? Are you referring to the $25 rebate. reimbursement rebate? Uh, we, we do have a little bit set aside, but unfortunately, without knowing the impact in that process to develop that pro uh, the process of someone coming in, requesting that refund, validating that they're eligible for that refund, we're still in the process of developing How that. How much do we put aside? I'm just curious. Uh, I'd have to go back and double check that number, but we'll bring that back to you July 7th. Okay. Good point. Okay. Commissioner Miller. And this question is for the chief. Um, I was just looking over the request, and we've heard a lot in the media about the need for upgrades at the building on 7th Avenue. So is this adequately, I mean, I see it listed here, but... Well, there, there's opinion. yes, man. There, there's several components. Uh, um, obviously, the, the, there's the increase in our funding as far as our maintenance, right. uh, which will make a tremendous impact. There's the additional money to, to revamp the old communications room, which the intent for that is to create a meeting area training room, so that way we can have community meetings at the police department uh, and not have to always schedule them somewhere else. So, so that funding will be significant. And there's also the uh, the funding there for needs assessment. You know, we, we did do a needs analysis and, and a projection of what it would cost to build a new facility. But, in, and, you know, Major Scott worked on that primarily. He was very uh, involved in the development of a new facility down in Gainesville. I worked on the one in Plantation. So we, you know, we combined and did what we could. But it obviously, it needs to be done professionally. Uh, you know, we do the best we can with the knowledge we have and, and based on the framework. So there's funding in there well as to do a true needs assessment to cost it out. Uh, and so we're taking a multi-pronged approach as far as making sure that we can improve our maintenance, uh, improve the facilities to, to make sure that we can be more accessible to the public and host more events there while also looking to the future with the needs assessment. So I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a big first step. 
it just didn't look like very much overall to really right. address what we'd heard. Well, if, if, so, if the plans are to, to sure. and it, that's one of those things now we have to balance out how much you want to invest in an older facility if we're, the plans are to build a new one in the next few years. So, but the, 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 to be able to revamp that communication center will be a huge asset for us. Uh, and the, the funding, the increased maintenance will make a, a tremendous difference. Good. Right. Commissioner Richardson. I, I, uh, it's not a question, but a uh, follow-up to uh, Commissioner G uh, Ziffer's comment about the amount of time that we have spent talking about law enforcement and not necessarily law enforcement but public safety public generally safety. yeah yeah and it's an excellent point but um, I think it's important for our community at this point that they know that we take this whole issue of public safety seriously because there are a lot of people out there with some concerns you know and they're asking questions uh, I was in a at a luncheon yesterday where they uh, that Reverend Holmes sponsored mm -hmm. Uh, and you were there, sure. Chief, and you heard those shocking numbers. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, is this Tallahassee where we live? Um, and so it's important that the community understand we take this issue very seriously from the perspective of their personal safety and our community's safety. But this also undergirds everything else that we will do as a city government and a county government to make Tallahassee a livable community. It determines visitors that want to come to our community. Uh, when parents are looking to where they're going to send their child to school, uh, to a university or college, uh, they don't want to Google Tallahassee and it be listed as one of the most crime-ridden cities, uh, you know, in the country, in the state, certainly. Uh, and it, it has an impact on what we will do in terms of economic development. Uh, and businesses that might want to locate to Tallahassee. So it is an important issue, and your point is, is well taken, Commissioner Ziffer, that, that um, I, I think the message should go out to the community that we're spending this kind of time talking about our community's ongoing safety and what we need to do to ensure that. It's not a traditional viewpoint, but public safety is really part of the critical infrastructure of yes, the city. Of course and it it's is. Absolutely. Of course it is. And it's, you know, not looked at as... It's certainly not the same as public works in the physical infrastructure, but as far as the, the growth and the healthiness mm -hmm. of the city. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll echo the comments uh, uh, by Commissioner uh, Ziffer and um, Commissioner Richardson uh, and, and yours that it is and absolutely it undergirds everything, the foundation upon which we build so much more. And what I appreciate is that we're not, you know, we're, we're not viewing this through kind of a singular lens, that it really is a panoramic. And there's so many points of entry that different components of our community have to creating a safe uh, environment. I mean, if, if you had to ask me, I'd say, yes, I do feel safe from day to day in this city, but that doesn't preclude or have any of us turn a blind eye to the fact that there are parts of this community that that is simply not the case. And it is not just a situation where you have an, a, a perpetrator, an, an offender uh, and a victim, but when you've got graduation activities going on and people are in their homes or on the street corner or in the front yard and they're ducking because someone's driving by shooting a bullet, then that becomes random acts that impact any one of us and can happen in any neighborhood. It just so happened that it happened in uh, that particular neighborhood a few weekends ago. And so for me, that changes the, the view of things. It is not I'm a bad guy and I did a bad thing and somebody's coming to pay me back, which is inexcusable in and of itself. But it is I'm a regular person and my kids, and this is the case for two DYG folks, and we heard their story this past weekend, the parents don't allow them to sleep in the bed because someone may shoot and they don't want their kid to be killed overnight. Who, I mean, I don't do that in my neighborhood, but there are people sure. in our community who are not letting their kids. So Anita asked them, the manager asked, how'd y'all sleep last night? And they said, good, we slept in a bed. Mm. That's, you know, that's, that's unacceptable in, in a city like ours. And so um, I'm, I'm um, well pleased with our conversation here, and I'm well pleased by, I think, our investment, uh, the, this commission's willingness to make the investment and taking the steps that are required to make this um, as, as safe a community as we possibly can. Um, I, and I appreciate you all your support and, and the work that we've been doing over the last 18 months, so thank you. I wanna, could I ask one more yes, question? Yes, Commissioner Miller. Cameras. Everything that I know about cameras I've learned from you, basically, <laughs> and then the articles that I'm sorry. a few people um, <laughs> send to me. But um, I, the point is that you have in the past 
indicated certain reservations about using the cameras and putting it in place. And I just want to make sure that you are, this is your recommendation and that you feel that this is the right path for us to take. Yes, my, my biggest reservations is not to just rush in, buy a bunch of cameras and turn them on. That it had to be a very thoughtful process. Uh, you know, part of the process that we're putting in place is a public education campaign so that way people understand how they work, when they're going to work, what the limitations are, what the purpose is, things like the privacy issues, and, and so that way we can provide information to the public as well because it's, you know, it, it's not a magic panacea that's going to make everything all better. Mm -hmm. It's just another tool, um, like I believe the Commissioner Maddox Commission has ever talked about earlier about, you, you know, the, the first and foremost thing is hiring the right people doing the right training, putting the right processes in place. And, and those are things that we've been working on too. You know, we, you know, we had Dr. Fidel here with the Federal Partial Policing Training. Every employee is getting trained in that. Uh, procedural justice training, everybody's getting trained in that. Uh, I'm waiting, I'm supposed to have the final report from PERF at the end of the month. I spoke with them a few weeks ago. Uh, we had one, uh, an initial review. There were some minor uh, revisions as far as dates and, and information like that. That final report should be here. Uh, they estimate at the end of this month, uh, those will deal with some of our high liability policies from use of force, the way we handle complaints from the community, how they're investigated. Uh, you know, so we're putting, you, you know, it's not just a singular approach. You know, the, the cameras are another aspect of what are we doing to show that we're accountable as well, that people can trust us, that there is a transparency there, and that, you, you know, when we do make a mistake or we do something wrong, it's addressed by the police department. And, you know, unfortunately, we've, we've had examples of that recently. And we do, when we find an issue, we'll, we'll address it and take care of it. And the cameras are just another way to reinforce that. I just wanted to make sure it was in a thoughtful process with the policies in place, the public having an understanding of, of the purpose, uh, the training of the officers, make sure that the privacy issues were cons uh, considered and that we were going to be able to do the, the program properly because because it is such a large multifaceted issue. And it's, you know, I think I, I used to line a few times, it's, you know, it's not going to Best Buy and just buying a camera and turning it on. Mm -hmm. it, there are so many components to it. You know, I, I know the state attorney's office is a little concerned with it as far as the, the overload of evidence. <laughs> you have a homicide scene and you have 10 officers in there with body cameras on. All that video footage is now part of your trial case you know so it, there are some additional impacts that are there and, and that's why we have talked to you know multiple partners about it we've had conversations with miss daniels mr meggs um uh, uh, mr landry reverend farrell you know you know looking both from a community approach and also from the traditional criminal justice standpoint of how it's going to impact everybody and, and what we can do to make sure it's successful okay well thank you yes, appreciate appreciate that. That. commissioners other flags either on the capital budget or the general budget that uh, folks want to raise while we're here Yes. But, uh, we did get an answer to your question. There's $20,000 budget for the rebate program. Okay. Got it. How many people will that cover? How many rebates will that cover? 800 divided by 25. 800. I know, but I can't, you know, <laughs> 800. sorry, 800. I admit it. I can't, you know, do it that 800. fast. 800. 800. Thank you. 800. You, Ma math ways. That's, that, that's math why we math. have I am so impressed. Four times 220, I guess. Okay. There you go. <laughs> well, commissioners, we, we've got a, a long road before conclusion uh, to this budget, but we have at least uh, flagged some, um, some issues. And I want to thank um, all of the staff, um, uh, the manager, the ACMs, uh, our budget staff. Uh, I think you all have provided us a public um, um, safety budget. Uh, and it is a budget that prioritizes the safety and security in our community. It prioritizes the needs of our first responders. Uh, and it's never a happy day when you have to look at uh, revenue enhancements. Uh, but I do believe we're the type of community that, that, that people are willing to pay uh, if we could guarantee them that things are going to be better on the opposite end of, of that investment. So uh, thank you all for putting together um, what is a comprehensive budget, one that lays out the future for our community and puts uh, public safety first and foremost um, uh, in the city's priority. So uh, we will adjourn for the day, and we'll see you at the next round. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.
poison? The answer is poison control. 1-800-222-1222. Call now for your free phone sticker before you need it. 1-800-222-1222. Thank you. 